right here on this peaceful river is where the story starts of a sea voyage that took us halfway around the world. A wartime sea voyage. Yep, it's the Mississippi. Old Man River himself. Sort of makes you homesick, doesn't it? Homesick for when you were a kid in the good old summertime, when you listened for the steamboat blowing for the bend. <laughs> Remember your first ride on a stern wheeler with her paddles biting into Mississippi water? And thinking maybe how you'd like to run away down the river on one of them to St. Louis or Memphis or maybe even New Orleans, then aboard a big ship out to sea? Well, that happened to me. It's a long jump from the middle of America to the deck of a seagoing freighter. But that's how I happen to know about this voyage that started right here in the town of Hannibal, Missouri, the hometown that Mark Twain made famous. It would have tickled old Mark, I bet, to have been with us. He liked to tell about big things happening, and they happened big to us, all right. He was a great traveler, too. And wherever he went, he brought his America, the real America of Hannibal, Missouri, along with him. And we did, too. We had the kind of adventures Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer dreamt about. There they are, looking out across the big river. Real American kids. The town of Hannibal has changed since those days, I guess. Paved streets and automobiles and so forth. The people haven't changed. When war came, they pitched in to work and fight so that the American brand of freedom and liberty could survive. Like every other American town, Hannibal had sent its boys to the battlefronts and her men and women were helping to win the toughest war America had ever been in. Now, when I said the town of Hannibal was the starting point of a wartime sea voyage, here's what I meant. Somewhere in one of the battle zones, the United States Army needed a railroad. Railroads mean freight cars, and freight cars need wheels. Now, railroad people everywhere will tell you Hannibal is famous for making car wheels. So Hannibal's car wheels went to war, and the first lap of their journey was from here in Missouri to the shores of California. Here's what happened to Hannibal's wheel. Now, if the Army wanted a railroad, there was only one place for it to come from, the good old USA, and only one way to get it overseas, on ships of the United States Merchant Marine. So out here on the docks of San Francisco, we began to take aboard our ship, car wheels for a railroad somewhere, we guessed, across the Pacific Ocean. This is early February, 1945. Lots of things are happening out there west of the Golden Gate. On shore, the newsboys are yelling that our troops have gone into Manila, that our Navy is plastering the Jap-held China coast, and our B-29s are stepping up the fire raids on the Nips home islands. So we were in a hurry to finish loading and get this cargo to where it was needed. The great port of San Francisco was naturally the jumping off place for most of the stuff moving west. We were just one of the hundreds of merchant ships taking war goods aboard. We were mighty proud of our brand new victory ship and uh, look at her name. She was one of the bunch named after American towns, you remember? Nobody aboard hailed from Hannibal itself, but that didn't stop us from adopting Hannibal as our hometown. Now we began stacking our holes with freight car underframes. I guess you'd call them chassis. The stevedores and longshoremen wasted no time fitting them below deck. Their job was to speed up what they called turnaround time. In other words, hustle each ship out of port as fast as possible. Because in war, it's the ship at sea, not at the dock, that counts. In the spaces between our bulky cargo, we packed small but badly needed stuff, such as K-rations, cots, 
hospital supplies like bandages and plasma, and dozens of other valuable items the boys overseas were hollering for. But this was the payoff cargo. Nothing less than eight full-grown railroad engines complete with tenders. Each engine weighed 55 tons, and its tender tipped the beam at 20 tons, complete with fuel oil. The idea was that these fellows would be ready to run as soon as we could set them down on rails somewhere in the Pacific. We were tied up to the dock where they had the biggest crane in the harbor, a 100-ton job. And the way that crane operator handled those babies, you'd have thought they were toy electric trains. But they weren't. They'd have dropped, well, the Hannibal Victory never would have even sailed from Frisco. One of our mates told me afterwards this voyage gave him a bad dream. He dreamed he was that old Greek king. What's his name? Damocles, that's it. But instead of a sword always dangling over his head, it was a locomotive. But one by one, they were set into place on the deck on either side of each hatch. Four hatches, eight locomotives. Easy. Easy does it. Now the last one's down. We'd laid regular road beds, you might say, out of big pine timbers to cushion the weight of the locomotives on our steel deck plates. The wheel flanges fit those timbers just like rails. And to keep them from shifting in a heavy sea, we welded turnbuckle and steel rod assemblies to the deck and clamped them tight and wedged, chained, and bolted them down. We were getting near the end of the loading job now, and all hands knew that sailing day was near. Somebody else knew our time was short, too. The chief mate had only been married a little while, but it doesn't take a woman long to find out that a voyage is likely to be a long one. I can remember the chief saying, I'm going ashore on a couple of errands. When I get back, I want to see number one hatch secured. Well, we went ahead with the job and got the big tarps lashed into place. Barcadero was windy that day. I saw her red hair all ruffled up and him with that baseball cap he always wore. I wonder how many million times in history some girl has gone down to the water's edge to watch her seafaring man off for what might be, well, for the last time. Anyhow, we began lashing down the cargo booms, tried to wind up all the last details before sailing time. sailing time was a secret. But do you think it could be kept 100% secret from her? Maybe she didn't know the exact hour. Oh, well, all I can say is I'm, I'm glad nobody was there to tell me goodbye. Best thing is to keep busy up to the last minute. You don't have any brass bands on the dockside when you sail in wartime. We practically sneaked away that cold February morning. But it takes a while to get out of San Francisco Bay, and if you've never done it, well, that's an experience. You watch the other ships, the great city built on hills slip by like on a movie screen. With our cargo out on deck sticking up like a sore thumb, we had a feeling everybody on shore was looking at us. The Bay Bridge is ahead. There's a hospital ship in from the Pacific. And that's a P-2, a big new type passenger ship converted to carry troops when war broke out. And those bridges. We had two army corporals aboard, nursemaids for the locomotives. And that's Sparks, our radio operator, with the Army Security Officer. 
they've sighted the Golden Gate Bridge ahead. Now we've been led through the submarine net and the Navy's seen our signals. The pilot's on the flying bridge with the skipper. The talker is checking his telephone. He's hooked up to each of the gun stations. That's Peg Leg and Joe on the engine. Funny how we got attached to those locos. The engines, I mean, not the guys. Now the Golden Gate's astern, and there's the pilot boat laying to to pick up our pilot. Now we know we're on our own. Dropping the pilot always makes you feel like you've cast off your last line to shore. The engineer opens the main throttle. The turbines start turning smoothly. Start spinning the big shaft which links up our 6,500 horsepower turbines to the propeller. It's gaining speed. Now you begin to feel the lift of the Pacific. This is what a ship is built for. I guess this is why a fellow goes to sea. So we're headed west. 10,000 tons of steel cargo in our holds and lashed to the deck hanging through the blue Pacific. The fast victory ship was the answer out here, all right. There's lots of ocean and time is short. We tried out our guns right away so we could turn back if anything was wrong with it. We're out at sea now and anything can happen. First morning out, sun peeped through just enough for the skipper to get our position. You got to admire the captain. He's already had two ships shot out from under him, but he's kept sailing, even though he wasn't getting any younger. Now he'd opened his sealed orders and was plotting our course for the navigation officer to follow. We were headed for Gaete, which was an army code word for a certain point of longitude and latitude. As far as we were concerned, it was destination unknown. As we steamed westward, the scuttle butt began. These seagoing rumors had us leading the invasion of the Chinese mainland, had us headed for the Philippines, for India, for Japan itself. But most of us had learned to discount this kind of talk and just to wait and see. So all we settled down to shipboard routine. We're on our maiden voyage, but the maintenance starts right away. You gotta like one thing if you go to sea and that is to paint. Anyhow, it's a fine job for the young fellas. Sort of reminded us of Tom Sawyer, how he got the boys not only to whitewash his fence, but to pay for the privilege. Remember? We told these lads it was good experience. You know, on this trip, half our deck crew were making their first voyage. They'd been through the government's maritime training schools, but they still had a lot to learn. Board ship is always something to be lifted or lowered or moved from here to over there. A block and tackle is the answer. In landlubber language, that's a pulley and a rope. And a faulty block might cause a mean accident. If you're not painting, then you're chipping away old paint, or so it seems. There was one routine job nobody ever tried to get out of. Keeping the lifeboat gear in first-class shape. When you need a lifeboat, you need it in a hurry. That's Peg Lake going aloft. The 
seems like he wanted all the tough jobs just because he did have only one real leg. The other was aluminum. You see, Peg had been in the Navy and around Guadalcanal somewhere, they got his ship. When he came to in the hospital, he owned one less leg, but that didn't stop him. Somehow or other, after he learned to use his shiny new leg, he still wanted to go to sea. So there he was, more of a man than any of us, we thought. In peacetime, you can tell what company operates a merchant ship by the colors on her stack. But in war, it was gray and black. This is a job for a man who knows how. And Maxie the bosun knew how. You gotta have tough hands for this. He's making a splice and wire rope. Maybe the day of the sailing ship is gone forever, but there's still a couple of miles of rigging strung around on a modern cargo ship. And practically all of it is steel wire rope, strong enough to lift several tons. So a modern sailor has got to know the special tricks of handling it. There's a splice, strong as the line itself. The rigging aloft has to be kept sluiced down with tallow and graphite so it won't rust and jam. And so the seagoing housekeeping went on. All the small jobs it takes to keep a ship sailing, no matter whether it's wartime or peace. Red was an ex-football player, but another of our lads very new to the seafaring profession. One day he came aft during his off watch to catch some air. So you get paid to watch a goonie bird, hey, Maxie asks. Maybe you're learning to fly to be a pilot, hey? Oh, says Red, I only came here on the back end to rest up a little. On the what? He Maxie yells. You and me are gonna go on a little tour. And he lectures as he goes. Mainmast. Cargo booms. That's number four hatch. On the bridge deck, maxi stock. Okay, is that the stack or the funnel? Red says, gee, Bolson, I don't know. Maxie says, I don't know either. make their way forward until they get to the flying bridge. This is on top of the wheelhouse and has a duplicate set of controls. Did they tell you what this was at school, Maxie asks? That's right, the wheel. And this? Correct, rabbinical. Now Red says, Bolson, I'll show you a thing or two. Lifeboat. Bulkhead, not wall. Porthole, not window. Deck, not floor. Foremast, cross tree, ventilator. Hatch. Cargo boom. Anchor windlass. Now they're all the way forward. Red pats the bulwark. The front end, he says. The what? Oh, Bosun, I'm sorry, I mean the bow. But Maxie's through. Be sorry below. Scram. This was another and very important routine job on the voyage, taking care of the locomotives. Those two GIs groomed those engines like they were prize racehorses. They spent practically all their waking hours spraying the engines with a gooey mixture of paint and oil which wouldn't dry out and greasing and oiling every moving part. Otherwise, the rust would have ruined them sitting out here in the salt spray. Funny thing about the two GIs, they'd been working for a railroad before they got in the army and now here they were doing the same thing as they did in peacetime. The day 
days went by in a hurry as we knifed westward through pleasant seas. The Pacific was living up to its name so far. I remember our first Sunday on that voyage. From the after gun deck came the sounds of singing. Hymns, it was. It was the Navy gun crew going to church in the sunlight, holding their Sunday services in the shadow of their own guns. It was a fine, full sound out in the clean air. The chief mate happened to be making his rounds because Sunday or not, we were a cargo ship underway and besides, they were waiting for us somewhere on the far side of the Pacific to deliver those locomotives in good shape. church services are part of Navy custom, but in his own quiet way, the chief mate joined in too. And all the while, the lookout scanned the face of the waters, kept watch upon the heavens. Sunday we had a strange visitor. Here we were 500 miles from any known land and this long-legged fellow comes aboard. Somebody said he must be a Jap spy so we caught him. Even a spy gets hungry we thought but he was here on business. Wouldn't have chow with us. We gave him a lift but what we didn't realize was he had business to attend to. Then we got it. He came aboard to inspect us. And with his hands behind his back in his white frock coat, he carefully checked over each turnbuckle and ring bolt, saw to it that our cargo was lashed down ship shape in Bristol fashion. And pretty soon he went back somewhere to make his report. Sunday was a good day for a lot of little personal jobs. We took turns cutting each other's hair, and some of the lads did a good job at it, too. Lots of advice from the customer. Also, you had a little time to repair your sea bag, for instance, with expert assistance, of course. Ever see a good ship without a monkey aboard? It was on Sunday you felt domestic turn to on some of your old household chores. The old timers knew how to take care of their own little problems like this. Maybe that's why so few sailors get married. They figure they can handle this department by themselves. Each man develops his own technique, you might say. Sunday was the day the boys in the stewards department showed off. What bread those guys baked. We all agreed that the Hannibal Victory fed well. And a well-fed ship is a happy ship, as any sailor knows. Pies makes my mouth water to think of them. The baker was as proud of his pies as mother used to be. Nobody would believe he hadn't ever had any experience before he signed up, but he swore that was the truth. So I guess he just had natural talent. Baker was a friendly guy, so maybe he didn't care if it was dangerous to leave any slices hanging around convenient-like. Better watch out. One of the 
One of the rules aboard our ship was that every man must have plenty to eat. The steward's department totaled about a dozen cooks, bakers, and messmen all told. Their job was to feed 80 hungry men. This meant serving six meals per day to take care of the men on the different watches, with coffee and sandwiches on hand any hour of the night or day. Food was first class, too. The war shipping people arranged it so every merchant ship could draw on stockpiles of hard-to-get provisions like meat, poultry, butter, eggs, and so forth. We carried our own refrigeration, of course, so we kept our food good and fresh and had a lot of menus so that nobody suffered from not getting all the vitamins or whatever it was they needed. No cover charge and a free floor show. Compliments of Tokyo Rose. The Japs had been smart enough to realize how much those phony broadcasts tickled us. They'd have cut them off the air. So officers and men sitting down to the same good chow, we had our Sunday dinner steaming along on a fair run through the mid-Pacific. Nobody seemed to have a care in the world. But you couldn't keep the engineers from talking shop. Revolutions, steam pressures, arguing the merits of turbines compared to the up and down engines on the Liberties, and so on and on. Well, a good meal calls for a good cigar. Our Navy lieutenant was an ex-football coach, by the way. Even the skipper loosened up after Sunday chow. We were wondering then how long and how bloody the road to Tokyo would be. The thing that you noticed about the armed guard crew was how young they were. Those were the kids who used to hang around the corner drugstore when school was out. They were filing clerks, machinists, helpers, farmers, sons. These were the soft, spoiled Americans who didn't stand a chance against the trained armies of Hitler, Mussolini, and Hirohito. With Chow over, those of us off watch were swapping lies or otherwise showing off our seafaring ability. That's Sully, the Hawaiian Irishman, showing what he learned in maritime school. He's another of the bunch we had aboard from the island. Joe was an ex-fisherman from Monterey. When war came along, he figured he could serve best in the merchant marine. And we agreed. Don't let the beard fool you, this was Tony's first voyage. But of course, the real expert on nautical matters was Red, as usual. he needed was a grass skirt. Then the old maestro shows how a fancy one is done. To one pair of lads aboard ship, Sunday wasn't entirely a day of rest. Our two cadet midshipmen had to finish a certain amount of studying by the time they reported back in the States. They couldn't help being a little homesick around the edges now and then. They were good kids and we're going to make good officers. Sunday was the traditional day for riding home. The mate was pretty good about it. But some of the rest of us just put it off, I guess. Put it off so long we didn't have anybody to write to. Well, the day is nearly over and the watch comes around to bring us back to reality. Back from our thoughts of home or games or books. It's time for blacking out almost dusk. Even a pinpoint of light can be seen miles away. At dusk and dawn, all hands report to battle stations. A flaming sunset might be a thing of beauty to an artist, but to an enemy submarine, it's the time of day when he's almost invisible on the dark surface of the water, while a ship stands out against the sky like a target in a shooting gallery. So the gun crew goes through their drill before the night hides us. just come from the bridge. Hawaii should be off the starboard bow any time now. The news is spread like wildfire among the islanders and our crew. Maxie goes aloft and finds out it's true. And they come running, all anxious for a glimpse of home. 
the whole gang swarms up to the top of one of the Samson posts. Pretty soon they get convinced that we're not headed for Pearl, but that we will pass through the island south of Oahu and keep our westward course. Where's Diamond Head now? Pearl Harbor's just beyond. We felt mighty sorry for those boys, for this was home they were passing by, but there wasn't anything we could do about it. It was an old story to Sam, the third mate. He was a Hawaiian himself, but today Diamond Head is only a point on the chart to him. Our business takes us westward, out where that big trooper came from. We happen to be batting the breeze in the crew's mess when somebody says, here we got eight iron mascots topside, and the so-and-sos don't even have names. Chris says he's got an idea. This ship is named for Mark Twain's hometown, right? And we got a whole set of Mark Twain's books the people of Hannibal gave us, right? All we gotta do is look in there. One's gotta be Tom Sawyer, somebody says. Yeah, and Huckleberry Finn. All the christenings take place. I wonder what it is makes a bunch of American guys give names to such items as planes and tanks and even trucks and railroad engines. somebody brought up a serious problem. What if some of these were lady engines? And somebody else yells, Hannibella. So Hannibella it was. We'd left Hawaii astern almost a week past, and the ocean was getting to look a little different to us. So far, it had been all smooth sailing. This couldn't last much longer. and we picked it up, a Pacific Atoll, Inuita, one of those island paradises the Japs made hell on earth for our Marines to take. Inuita is an almost circular chain of islands, the rim of an extinct volcano, about 30 miles across. Inside its deadly coral reefs, the deep lagoon of blue water is protected from the open sea. And as we rounded the point where the Navy had built a shore station, we saw ships of every size, type, shape, and kind. Warships and merchant vessels as far as you could see. There's the Sarah over there, the carrier, Saratoga. And there were dozens of other victory ships like ourselves and big rusty-sided liberties, the seagoing workhorses of this war, and long gray tankers, fast destroyer escorts, attack transports, and attack cargo ships, LSTs, landing craft, patrol boats, America's maritime might, all gathered together out here in the middle of the Pacific. Pretty soon the harbor boat comes hustling up with orders from the Navy port director on where we're supposed to anchor. thirds of the way across the Pacific, 5,000 miles from San Francisco. But the real tough going lay ahead of us. Now was the chance to check up on our life-saving equipment, to go over the lifeboat gear with a magnifying glass almost, check the provisions and water, 
first aid equipment and navigating instruments in the boats. We had the latest kind of rig. The boats were launched by gravity and were hoisted by electric-powered davits. The bosun took personal charge of this detail so you can be sure everything was done right. For some of us aboard who'd sweated out long, blistering hours in the tropics in lifeboats like these before getting rescued, or who had nearly frozen to death in them after getting dumped in the North Atlantic, but we'd somehow come through. Luck, I guess. 5,000 of our shipmates in the Merchant Marine were never seen again. Yes, we wanted to be sure we had something to hitch our lives to if the Hannibal took a hit from a kamikaze or a sub. Anchored at Anahuitoc, life was not so bad. We had to wait for other vessels that were to make up our convoy, and so, in the meantime, you couldn't keep the fellows out of the clear blue water. Makes you want to dive in, and these lads wasted no time, including a little showing off. After all, some of them were athletes and knew their stuff. And as for the Kanakas and other island boys, they were practically born with webbed feet. They clowned around, gave everybody a lot of laughs, while we waited for the serious work yet to come. long to wait. We broke out the laundry and the Navy began rounding us up for the convoy. Aircraft from the carriers streaked low overhead. An escort vessel began to corral the tankers. And it was anchors away for the Hannibal victory. We were going to make the last long stretch of our journey in the strength of each other's presence. No longer would we be traveling alone. There's one of our sister ships, a victory swinging into position. Everywhere you looked, the whole surface of the big lagoon was busy with ships getting into position to leave through the narrow pass between the islands. Signalmen were working the big blinkers we all carried. This was the way we talked with each other out here, for we were under tight orders not to break radio silence. We had to keep our exact distance within the pattern of the 50 vessels that made up the convoy. Along with us were 10 big tankers, all carrying high-octane gasoline and bound for Saipan. This was the great test of strength. Our ability to keep the sea lanes open for the steady flow of fuel for the B-29s that were blasting the Japanese home islands into rubble. It made us mighty proud of our merchant marine to realize that air power in the Pacific was directly dependent upon us. Now the whole battle zone lay ahead. The word got around. One more stop, maybe, at an advance base and then the Philippines. We were pretty sure that was where we were headed. We realized we were in Indian territory now, and like our forefathers in covered wagon days, we had to keep our eyes peeled and our powder dry. The tropic nights were beautiful and dangerous. We were blacked out like the inside of a cat. Then, one dawn, we made landfall. It was late the Jap defenses had broken during the landings of a few months ago. We exchanged blinker signals and were told to come to anchor. The Japs still infested those dark hills. Underneath us, they were lying dead on the bottom because here they first used their kamikaze planes against our cargo ships, while our soldiers hung onto the beachhead. But we weren't going to stay here long. The word was passed. We were headed for Lingayan Gulf. That's where they needed the railroad to connect up with Manila. This time, more ships were joining us. A special task force of escorts, LSTs, and a couple of big Navy transports like this fellow, 
bound for a private invasion of their own. Only a few weeks before, this was where one of the great battles of history took place. The Jap Navy tried to smash our Leyte invasion and met instead the gunfire from our battle wagons and planes from the carriers of our 3rd and 7th fleets. Now all gun stations were manned. All lookouts were posted, for the Japs were still holed up in these Philippine islands, even if we have got them on the defensive. And we've got air cover, too. We all carried valuable cargo. But if we thought ours was worth a lot, what about that big C-type ship off to starboard? She was a trooper with 2,000 American GIs aboard. And behind us in column, and alongside the starboard with the LSTs. picked up unidentified signals on the sound detectors. Our lookouts strained their eyes for telltale signs of a sub. There, between the trooper and the LST. Is that a silver streak in the water? Juicy target, this convoy, loaded with men and tons of supplies. But the Japo subs were in even greater danger. These lads wanted bad to paint a Jap flag on our funnel. To get a Jap on our maiden voyage. suddenly veers across our course. Maybe they've located others we can't stop to find out. The alert is still on. The weather is closing in on us. A rain squall is an ideal time for attack. Below the surface, another nip sub may be laying in the gap. the signal leaps from ship to ship. All clear, all clear. The alert is over, and a welcome rest for our nerve-strained crew moving aft for a heartening cup of java. For a quick rest before they go on watch. Except for Weedy, it's his first attack. 
and we've come through on top. The China Seas belong to us now. For Halsey and his carriers arranging the shores of Asia off the port from Saigon to Formosa. In the islands, the Japs are still fighting stubbornly. But we have the feeling of power now, sea power in the Pacific, which means we can keep open the sea routes to our armies, keep pouring into them the flood of America's production, which is steadily swamping our enemies. Behind us are the Liberties, 10,000 ton cargo ships, symbols of the power and the will to win, which have rocked the sons of heaven back on their heels. our destination. We got saluted, too, in a way. That destroyer's throwing a salvo at the enemy back in the hill. We're at the head of Lingayen Gulf, where the Japs first invaded in 1941, and where we landed to drive down on Manila. The lads are wasting no time on buttoning our locomotives. The enemy is shelling the anchorage with guns they took from Corregidor. Here comes the landing craft. They'll take the smaller stuff to shore. We need something bigger to handle this floating railroad yard on our decks. These fellows can handle the K rations. But this baby can take 70 tons at a time. Cast it off, Jack. This harbor's hot. And we don't want to get caught with this stuff on our decks. Here's the answer, an LCT, landing craft tanks, which will ferry the locos from us to shore. A neat trick if they can swing it. Remember our lifting beam? We brought it along, and now the lieutenant in charge is showing them how to corral it and make it fast to the engine. He was an oil well rigger from Texas. Must have been a cow hand, too. Now, the rolling stock is foot loose. get away in secret. We all turned out to watch him go. Getting the tenders off came next. of Rome had a full inch to spare on either side. Now, despite the fact that the Gulf was getting rougher, the word was passed to hurry up the job. The military situation ashore called for faster supply from the big base here at Lingayen along the road to Manila. So we worked late into the day, taking chances we usually wouldn't, to get our rolling stock ashore. They needed these engines on the rails, hauling men and supplies. We worked until darkness caught up with us. Mm -hmm. 
With gaps all around us, we kept lookouts posted, but the night was inky black. He caught us flat-footed. A single, solitary Jap bomber gliding in low let loose one stick of bombs on the ammunition dump ashore. You feel like crying watching the sweat and labor of thousands of people in the factories back home go up in smoke and flame. Not to mention the guys aboard the ammo ships who risked their necks to get it here. All in one night's fireworks. It's a pretty rough lesson in what a terrible waste war is. smoky over the anchorage. But by the time the LCT moved up to the dock with her load, the breeze had swept the morning clear. This shore had taken a lot of beating, both from us and the Japs. But the Army had rigged up a husky dock and laid rails on it so as to take the engines. Only the last lifting job now, and the transfer would be complete. The railroad to Manila would be ready to run. You couldn't help wondering how Mark Twain would have told the story of the locomotive that went to sea and flew through the air. As Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, Annabella, and the others finally got their wheels on terra firma. Railroad engines with names many a Filipino would wonder about for years to come. Touchdown. Our ready-to-run engines are going to get one more lift before they're under their own steam. By one of the always-present ducks, which work on land and water. It'll tow our locomotives onto solid ground once again. Strange setting to find our engines in. They'll carry the war goods first, but we know that after this war is over, they'll mean a lot in the rebuilding of the Philippines, helping our friends get on their feet again. Maybe she'll have a better world to live in because of those engines. Right now, like kids everywhere in this war, it's Hello Joe. Now we've got news. While our railroad engines are ready to roll to Manila on their own power, we're told that Manila Bay is open. We're to take the rest of our cargo to Manila where the railroad battalions have set up a shop to put them together. So we steam out of Lingayen Gulf around the South China Sea into the harbor our Army and Navy has taken back from the Nips. There's Corregidor, the rock. And Bataan of proud and sorrowful memories. We see they've begun to route other merchant ships into the Anchorage already. And since the docks of Manila are smashed, we drop the hook offshore and this time unload our cargo into LCMs. It's almost the end of the journey for the car wheels. Now we've all heard of what has happened to Manila, so those of us who can, leave the ship, climb aboard the shuttling LCMs, and head for shore. For some of us, this was the first time we'd be able to see the destruction left by modern warfare. We lay our course into the mouth of the Pasig River.
First, the Japs wrecked the waterfront, and then we had to blast them out, and we came back. It'll be many years before these scars are healed. Our wheels are coming ashore. Filipino stevedores get busy. The wheel trucks have to be set on tracks and the car frames fastened to them. Here's a Filipino, Tom Sawyer, to help. Our railroad men check the bearings and look over the blueprints. Then get busy, for the engines will soon be down from Lingayan to pull the freight cars. This is where a wheel belongs, on a rail ready to roll. In the meantime, the chief mate is taking a look at what used to be familiar street scenes. Manila was once a peaceful, prosperous city. Others from the Hannibal victory are ashore too. They've looked on ruined cities from Murmansk to Malta, but this is the worst. You don't feel very kindly toward the Nips, seeing something like this. Now comes the job of putting the couplings on the car frames. are lowered onto the wheel trucks. After this, they'll use them as flat cars and build box cars on the chassis. Job's nearly done. The mate told us afterwards he couldn't help thinking of the difference in what he saw in the broken ruins of Manila and what we'd done by bringing over a cargo that had helped rebuild this country. The merchant marine was a weapon of peace, too. Our locomotives had pulled into Manila now, ready to get their loads rolling to help finish the fight. We've left our name behind us here. The voyage of the Hannibal victory is complete. Engineer gets his orders. of luck to you, Hannah Bella. for the town of Hannibal, for all the hometowns of America.